was, uh, man, those were just powerful messages just about connecting with the Holy Spirit and connecting, you know, it's, it's important uh, to have a personal relationship with the Holy Spirit, okay? Too many times we live off of a secondhand revelation and we sell, we sell our own revelation short, okay? And uh, you, okay, David took down Goliath with five smooth stones and, and his sling in his pouch, right? Okay. Remember, he tried on Saul's armor and it didn't fit him. And uh, why did he have five smooth stones? Somebody said, well, Goliath had four brothers. I don't think that was it. I think, uh, I think it was just in case he missed. <laughs> He's going <laughs> to... He's going to make sure and take the, the dude down. Uh, he just had a backup plan. But the, here's the point. The point is, it's, he used what he knew. Okay? And, uh, and, he, and he used that with the lion and the bear. And so too many times what we do is we, we listen to whoever your super duper is, if it's, if it's your pastor or if it's Andrew or if it's, you know, whoever, you know, Joseph Prince or whoever it is, okay? Um, the, and, and thank God we can receive and should be listening to others and receive revelation from other people, other men and women of God, all right? But, but uh, it's not Saul's armor that's going to take down Goliath. Yeah. Amen. That's right. Yeah. That's right. No, let me say that real clear, okay? Saul's armor, Andrew's armor, Joseph Prince's armor is not going to kill your Goliath. Amen. Okay? It's what's, yeah, you can receive revelation from them, but then you've got to go into the secret place and, all right, Lord, you're going to have to make this real to, with me. Yeah. Right? You're going to have to, you, I've, got to I've got to know your love for me. That's right. Okay? And then I've got to go out and speak it with authority. Uh, I'm not, I can't, I can, look, we've got, uh, we've got assignments from God, and we've got giants to take down yet. Yes. Would you agree? Yes. Okay, there are enemies that stand in the way. We, we, we battle those, and, and by the way, they're not flesh and blood. Our, our enemies are not flesh and blood. We're to, we're to intercede for those who are pawns of the enemy, not vilify them and demonize them, but anyway, we, we come out of that place that we hear from God and we speak what we're hearing. Okay, it's like with my, my oldest, we've, I have four children and 12 grandchildren. And uh, my oldest son, um, if Dr. Dobson had met him, he would have written three more chapters in his book, A Strong-Willed Child. <laughs> <laughs> because, because you know, Brian, if you if you told him if you drew the line and you had consequences, I mean, he's going to cross it. And anyway, <laughs> we had all kinds of problems with him growing up, and then you know, we testing everything, and and even even about five years from his teenage, older teenage years into uh, college age, and and then the enemy would the enemy came to us and and tried to. Uh, the detours, right, and the and the disappointments and the and the things that you know, his his life was totally different than what we trained and raised him to be. But we had to go into that place of knowing God loved us and and intimate intimacy with God and hear what God is saying. And the judgments of God are that Brian is a man of God. He's taught of the Lord, and great is his peace. And he's going to speak with the, with the, his enemies in the gate. And so the enemy, the devil would come to me and say, you know, what kind of pastor are you? What kind of parent are you? You know, look at your son. And I said, well, Mr. Devil, while you're here, <laughs> let me tell you the way it really is. That, and I just quote the word. That my son's taught of the Lord, great is his peace. He's going to speak with his enemies in the gates, which is you. You're going to rue the day you ever came against my son. Let me tell you, I just 
started prophesying. He's a leader in the kingdom. I started prophesying his future. Listen, I just, I had my pouch. I have my five smooth stones ready because yeah. I've been in the presence of God and I knew what God said and didn't matter what was going, you know, it, it, things weren't going right in the natural, but, but how many of you know we're that, the first report's not the last report? That's right. That's right. And we have to go inside the presence of God and, and come, come out of that place with what we're convinced that God's spoken to us about our lives, our marriages, our families, our churches, our ministries, uh, any opposition, our city, our state, our nation. What is God saying? And, and look, he's, he's just looking for someone who will agree with him and come out and declare what he says. Yeah. And, and that's, that's one of those five smooth stones, man. Yeah. And if you hold on to that and don't let go of that, don't give up on that, then, I mean, that, that giant's coming down. Whatever that giant is. Amen. But he's not doing it through Andrew's revelation that's secondhand with you. Or anybody else's. Amen. It's you come you going into, into that place with him yes. and hearing what he's saying to you. Jesus said, I will build my church, Amen. and the gates of hell sure. will not prevail against. It. I will build my church. And and in Psalm 127. Uh, I think it's verse 1 and 2, except the Lord build the house. They labor in vain that build it. So I don't want to be building, I don't want to build wood, hay, and stubble. I just want to, Lord, you just tell me, how do you want to build this? And what, and what, um, what Sandy and Dave were talking about today, that's how we build. That's how we do it. It's, it's, we get in a secret place. God, what are you saying Okay, here's what the enemy's doing, but you know, but what are you saying? And how do you want to change that? And then we get in agreement with him, and we, then we declare it, we speak it, we prophesy it, we act on it, we, you know, and it may not happen right away, but it's going to happen. Amen. It, as long as we don't let go of it. Amen. That's how God, he, look, God builds his kingdom two ways, through revelation and relationship. Through revelation and relationship. He builds his kingdom through revelation and relationship. There, there, there are no lone rangers in the kingdom. Big doors. God's opening big doors with little hinges. And sometimes it's the smallest, seemingly most insignificant relationship or even revelation that God will open doors for you. And, and what these guys, you know, I can't, uh, I'm not patronizing them. I'm just saying that we, okay, God sent us here and he taught us last night that what, we've get, what he's put in us is significant. And then these guys, uh, basically last night was encouragement, okay? Uh, for, for us to, hey, God's with you. He loves you. He believes in you. He's thanking you. Um, and then, uh, you know, you, but, uh, but that he's still going to bring it to pass. But then they talk today about how to bring it to pass. That's how we get it. That's how it happens. Is he, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not touching what he's asked me to do in my, with my flesh and, and my own ideas and, 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 with some, and with some, you know, corporate sense of how God's supposed to build a church. I, I, what you get from a conference, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get it in his presence He's going to download it with me. I, I can't, that's all I can be, and you and I can be responsible for. Yeah. What are you speaking? Right? Yeah. And I'm, I'm done with all this, you know, stuff that just, you know, men are trying to, you know, build the church in corporate ways. It's just, it's just, you know, garbage yeah. on steroids. Yeah. Okay, he, he builds his church. Jesus said, I will build my church. So if he's, if you're a leader in his church, and these are pastors and leaders here, right? If you're a leader in his church, he's going to download revelation to you. It, but it, with your family, okay, with, with your, with your, in your, in, if you're in your business, in your relationships, and in your church and ministry, that's how, that's how he does it, guys. God, you're going to have to show me. You're going to have to show me. What do you want to do? 
and then, then I get in a secret place, I hear from him, I go out, I, I agree with it, I go out and speak it. I don't focus on what I don't know. I focus on what I do know. Yeah. I don't despair about what I don't know. I just, <laughs> I just mm -hmm. magnify. Look, we're all, like Will Rogers said, we're all ignorant, yeah. just on different subjects. Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't know everything. But what I know, I know. Okay, and I'm, I'm going to magnify what I know. And so I just... That's more a little bit of an exhortation and kind of, you know, putting together what God's doing so far because he said what, you're, what he's called you to do is significant. But look, this is how he builds, guys. He builds, through, he builds through what he reveals to you, but also who he connects you with. Amen. And too many times, it's, just, it's like what Dave was saying, he's got a divine connection for you in the grocery store, but you're just so, you know, you're just so focused on where you're going, we're supposed, we need to walk slow through the crowd because God's got divine connections for us if we'll just, if we'll just be in tune. Amen? Amen. So um, I, I just wanted to kind of put, because that's what I'm sensing. I'm sensing God's putting some things together. And then this, what I'm going to share next um, it, 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 I don't know how it connects. I think it's going to connect, but I'm not going to try to make. I'm not going to. I'm not going to try to. I'm not going to try to make it connect. Too many times we. Too, too many times we try to force things and make things happen, and I don't like that. So I don't think God does either. So hey, I do want to encourage you to get my book. Uh, it's my latest book is flowing in the supernatural. the The whole premise of it is we're too seeker sensitive. And we need to be God-sensitive. We need to be spirit-sensitive. We don't need to be people-insensitive, as I'm, what I'm going to share with you here in the next, next session. Uh, we don't need to be insensitive, but we, don't, we need to be more God-sensitive. And, and uh, what I, I learned uh, through, through mentors of mine, like, like several of you had you know, Fred as a, as a mentor, and now you have mentors here and we we are we are the mentors now right we're the we're the fathers but but I had John Osteen as a mentor of mine and not Joel his dad yeah. John if you, how many of you ever heard John oh, yeah. he's a mentor too. He, had, he had a large church and he their gifts operated and it was in order um, I had um, Kenneth Hagan was a great mentor of mine uh, where the, the he was the, the real balance of the word and the spirit. Jack Hayford was a mentor of mine. And Jack Hayford, I called him the apostle of balance. The, he, he would stop in the middle of a service. And if there was a gifts operated, and he just, in such a calm way, say, now what you guys have just seen, here's where you can find it in the Bible. And, and it's like, there, it wasn't, he, didn't, he wasn't demonstrative. And it was, but but it was very clear, and and it and it ministered to people, and and uh, then uh, Bob Nichols, who is a pastor in Fort Worth, is a, who's my pastor, was a great mentor of mine of uh, the move of the Spirit and and the balance of the Word and the Spirit, and then Andrew Womack, and so uh, and then there's then I had a, a prophet named Ron Smith, uh, who was uh, Brother Hagen talked about Mom and Dad Goodwin down in. Pasadena, Texas, where he learned a lot about the gifts of the Spirit. Ron Smith was, Ron and Carolyn were their associates. And uh, I know Sandy and Joe have been there. I don't know if you did, Dave, but uh, they went to some of Ron before Ron passed away. And he was a prophet that came to my church. And I mean, he, he would stir us up, man. And he would say, he would say, Paul Milligan, you stand up and you're going to, you're going to give a message in tongues and Pastor Greg's going to interpret it. And I'm thinking, can we do that? You know? <laughs> yeah, we can. And he just stirred up the prophetic and uh and and modeled it and it was just it was just phenomenal. Well, I've got a lot of those stories in this in this book, and, and I really I really encourage you to, to get there's there's so many good things in here that will help you. The whole thing is that we can have the word, but how many of you know? We need the book of Acts was the move of the Spirit too. Supernatural. We, and, and where's the supernatural today? And people are hungry for the supernatural. If the church, do, if the church forsakes the Holy Spirit, 
the move of the Spirit and the supernatural. The world's going to go get it on, you know, what, whatever that dial uh, uh, thing, you know. Uh, well, no, what's that thing where those, where those? They're basically they're uh, they're not prophets. They don't call them prophets. So, Psychics, yeah, dialapsychic.com, you know, and and that's what the that's what the world's going to go for if if the church doesn't do this. I want to give this to Pastor Steve, and uh, it's a signed copy. Okay, open your Bibles wherever you'd like to. I'm going to be in um, I'm going to be in Isaiah verse nine, chapter nine, and I'm also going to we're also going to go to Psalm 133. And I'm going to tell you funny first. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. It's called a farmer named Clyde. So a farmer named Clyde had a tractor accident. In court, the trucking company's fancy hotshot lawyer was questioning Clyde. Now, didn't you say, sir, at the sign of the accident, I'm fine? Asked the attorney. Clyde responded, well, sir. I'll tell you what happened. I just loaded my favorite cow, Bessie, into the, into the uh, trailer, and he said, I didn't ask for any details. The attorney said, just answer the question, please. Did you or did you not say at that scene of the accident, I'm fine? And Clyde said, well, sir, like I said, I just got Bessie into the trailer behind the tractor, and I was driving down the road, and the lawyer, lawyer interrupted again. I said, Your Honor, I'm trying to establish the fact that at the scene of the accident, this man told the highway patrolman on the scene that he was just fine. Now, several weeks after the accident, he's trying, to, he's trying to sue my client. I believe he's a fraud. Please tell him to simply answer the question. By this time, the judge was fairly interested in Clyde's <laughs> answer and said to the lawyer, lawyer, well, I'd like to hear what he has to say about his favorite cow, Bessie. Clyde thanked the judge. And proceeded. Well, as I was saying, sir, I just loaded Bessie, my favorite cow, into the trailer, was driving her down the highway when this huge semi truck and trailer ran the stop sign, smacked my John Deere tractor right in the side. I was thrown into the ditch on one side, Bessie was thrown into the other, and I was hurting real bad, and I didn't want to move. However, I could hear old Bessie moaning and groaning. I knew she was in terrible shape just by her groans. Shortly after the accident, a highway patrolman came on the scene. He could hear Bessie moaning and groaning, so he went over to her. After he looked at her and saw her fatal condition, he took out his gun, shot her between the eyes. Then the patrolman came across the road. <laughs> gun still in his hand and looked at me and said, how are you feeling, sir? Now, now, now you tell me, judge, what, what in the world would you say? I'm fine. I'm doing just, I'm doing just fine. Oh, that's funny, man. Praise God. Okay, I've, and I've got on my... Uh, on my website, gregmore.com, I've got I've got several funnies. I'll, I'll tell I'll tell you one more. This is this is funny. This is really funny. S studies have shown that women who are a bit overweight live longer than men who mention it. <laughs> How do I look, honey? Oh man, you are awesome. You look hot. You're awesome. Praise God. Huh. Okay, so um, all right. Th this is kind of, this is going to kind of seem a little bit uh, like it's it's not actually opposed to what we we're talking about last night. It's like la last night we talked about you know man. Okay, God values things differently than we do, not by size or anything, and and um. And then I was talking, remind me of you, you guys' names here again. David and, David and Elaine. Elaine. And then they, they have, uh, I'm going to look at this book, but they, they've 
they had this uh, read this book uh, called the Grasshopper Myth. Was that it? Mm-hmm. And um, that lines up with the same with the same principle. So that's one side of the coin, is that we have to realize that what we're doing is significant, and we and we cannot be comparing ourselves among ourselves. That's that's not wise. Okay, it'd be like it's it's like. Uh, Okay, you remember when Jesus came to Peter and told him three times, do you love me after the resurrection? And Peter denied him three times, so he's saying, you know, you know I love you, you know I love you. He said, well, look, here's the deal. Feed, feed, my, feed my lambs, feed, I mean, feed my sheep, feed my lambs, uh, feed my sheep, fo- follow, and then he said, follow me, right? Follow me. What are we supposed to do? follow him you and then you you heard this morning how we follow him we get in his presence we let him download to us what he what he calls us to do and we follow him but then you know and but then he then he added a little bit tidbit to him about a little revelation about his future and he said now you know at the end of your life uh somebody's going to carry you where you don't want to go you're going to you're basically you're going to die a bad death are you okay with that peter you're going to die anyway so do you you're going to are you okay are you, are you willing to follow me? And then Peter said, well, yeah, you know, as long as my friend John, as long as he dies a bad death too, I mean, I'm, <laughs> if he dies a bad death, I'm, I'll, I'll be willing to follow you. And Jesus says, what is that to you? What, what if, I, what if, I, what if he, I, my will is for him not to die at all? Is that okay? That'd be like God assigning to you to go to some, to some uh, place on a mission field where, you're not going to live in luxury, right? Okay. And let's say he let's say he calls Dave there, okay, to that place, and then I mean, and and then uh, but then he but then he calls uh he calls Pastor Leroy to win the lottery. Mm-hmm. Of course, I don't know if Pastor Leroy is going to buy a lottery, but let's say let's say let's say Pastor Leroy that's that. Let some, somebody gives you the lottery ticket, a lottery ticket that they bought. Hey, I'll sanctify that lottery ticket. Hallelujah. <laughs> anyway, that he wins the lot. Are, are you okay, Dave, with, with going there? If God's ordained that he wins the lottery, are you okay Yo. following God? Yeah, your friends. <laughs> I, <laughs> I know it's true. Long as, yeah, I, don't mind if they, I don't mind if they win the lottery as long as they tithe, right? <laughs> But, but, you know, and we get into this comparison thing, and it's all relative, guys. The bottom line is each of us has an assignment. Each of us ha- has a calling. Each of us has gifts, and we, we need to, okay, grace, people's understanding of grace uh, is, is, very, is very narrow, okay, because grace, uh, most people's understanding of grace is Ephesians 1, 2, and 3. Um, which is essentially what Jesus did for us at the finished work of the cross, what we have because of that. We're seated together in heavenly places, right? And then, he, the, uh, then what you read about his great love for us. All of that, okay, our authority over the, over the enemy, all of that. And, but that's just, that's just three chapters of the book of Ephesians, and that's just one dimension of grace. Um, but First Peter four ten and eleven says the grace of God is is a the manifold grace of God. It's it's many sided, it's multi dimensional. If your understanding of grace is just Ephesians one two and three, you're in, it's you've got an incomplete understanding of it. Are you hearing me? Yeah. So you've got that, but because of four five and six says therefore because of what Jesus did because of what you have, and then. Um, and all and his great love for you walk worthy of the call and then he talks about a lot of responsibility things there's there is discipleship grace or responsibility grace that's grace too there's giving and receiving grace right yeah. there's leadership grace and there and there is assignment grace second corinthians uh, 10 the apostle said i don't go i don't go beyond the, me- the measure of the sphere that's been assigned to me. There, we, each of us has grace to do what God's called us to do, right? Yes. 
okay? And, and here's the thing, okay? First of all, I'm not going to compare myself with Dave's calling or his grace assignment. I can learn from him. But, and so I, even if his ministry gets larger than mine, I'm not going to feel, you know, smaller than him or more insignificant than him. Does that make sense? Okay. But I do want to fill up. I do want to fulfill everything within the sphere of my assignment. Right? Okay. I mean, I'm okay. I'm not, maybe I'm not called to be a mega church pastor. Don't curse the mega church that's in your town because it'll ultimately, ultimately it'll become a feeder to your church because people get tired of being, being counted as a number, okay? But, but the bottom line is, I do want to, okay, I'm not going to value myself by comparing myself with somebody else's assignment, but I do want to fill up to the full my assignment. I, I do want to see the increase, that, whatever realm of increase that is, I do want to see that increase in my church, in my ministry, and I, I want, you know, I do want to see God do some significant things in my life yeah. and whatever my assignment is. How many of you are with me? Yes. And so there's this balance of we kind of, I'm not going to be comparing myself with somebody else's assignment, but Lord, I want you to show out big in mine. Yeah. Amen. Okay. I mean, I, because I just, I want to manifest Jesus where I am. Yeah. And so I want to talk to you about a couple of things here and one of, one of them's a spiritual principle. The other one is a spiritual principle, but it's a whole lot of practical things. So I want to talk to you about it. So um, look, at, look at Isaiah 9 in verse 7. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Um, so I, I want to talk to you about how we can how we can, our, our churches, our ministries can increase to, to, to their assigned capacity. Because he said here, when his government's in place, there's going to be no end of increase. Yeah. So God does want increase. It's just, I, I, he, he, he wants it to be done his way, right? right? And so the first thing I want to talk about that, that would that what I basically what I want to share with you about is what I've seen. I pastored for 27 years, and we've Janice and I visit churches all over. And there are some things, guys, in the church that we can change by revelation that will remove hindrances and allow increase to come. Okay. Yeah. That, and and if I could if I could meet with your church leaders and pastor if pastors were secure enough, I could meet with your church leaders and we could identify some elephants in the room. Yeah. And some of them are just practical stuff, guys. But but it's got a spiritual premise behind it because because pastors are afraid to deal with some practical things because we don't want to offend Sister, you know, Louise, who's married to Daddy Big Bucks. Can we just be real? Okay. Do you, how many of you want your ministries to grow? And you want your churches to grow? And you want your businesses and everything? Okay, guys... It all, it, it all starts with, are we, are we willing to let, let God provide leadership where we are? So the first thing, the first thing is Psalm 133. Look, look there with me. Because he said, where his government is, the increase in peace, there's going to be no end. Let me ask you a question, guys. Look at, look at your ministries right now in your churches is is there in, is there peace and increase? Is there peace and increase? Okay, and and I'm not. And again, I'm not. You know, we got to be faithful with what God called us to do, 
but we also have to be, we can't be unwise. We have to identify, all right, Lord, is there something, is there anything that we're doing or not doing that's hindering that the, the release of your increase in peace, right? So is it okay if we look at this today, guys? Okay, so Psalm 133, Psalm one, the first part of this has to do with unity in your leadership, okay? So Psalm 133, behold how good and pleasant it is, verse one, to dwell for brethren to, to dwell together in unity. It's like the precious oil upon the, upon what? Everybody said the head. Running down on the what? Okay, the beard of Aaron. Running down on the edge of the garments, it's like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. For there, where? Where? In the place of unity. There, the Lord commanded the blessing, life evermore. How many of you can, could use some blessing in life evermore? Yeah. Commanded blessing. Okay. The, the, place of, the place of unity is the place of blessing. And understand this, okay, this is a pastors and leaders conference, okay? Unity is strictly and only a leadership issue. Has nothing to do with the people that come in on Sunday morning. Has everything to do with who's in leadership. There is no possible way to have unity just gathering folks together. It's, it's, it's the gathering of the leaders that you have together. Unity is strictly and only a leadership issue. It starts at the head. Of course, Jesus is the head, but then whoever, whoever is, you know, the shepherd or under shepherd or shepherds under Jesus in a church or in a ministry, that's, that's where unity starts. And then it goes down over the beard. What does the beard represent? Hopefully maturity, right? And so too many times what happens in leadership is we're not stewarding, we're not realizing the, the, the power of unity. If you want blessing and you want increase in peace and you want blessing in life, okay, guys, it's, we have a responsibility to steward the unity among our leadership team. Okay, and then you don't want to put unbearded ones, immature ones, inexperienced ones, big pocket money folks that, that are immature in a place of leadership. You are sentencing yourself to no increase and no peace That's right. and no blessing and no life forevermore. Okay? And, I mean, this is just reality, guys. And we don't, we don't want to address this because we want to be inclusive, you know, especially in this season of grace. We want to just, you know, come on in and come on and serve and do whatever you, you, know, do, do whatever you want to do. You know, no, guys, that's, you, you have a responsibility to steward the vision of the house, what God's called you to do in that church. And, and people come in, I know, I mean, I, when you pastor 27 years, you learn a few things. I know I don't look that old, but, we, you know, I started way young. And, <laughs> but, you know, you, people come in, they have all kinds of different motives and agendas. Yeah. And, and can I tell you this, I mean, I just learned this dealing with people, that when, when misunderstanding and drama follow somebody, misunderstanding, constantly misunderstanding and drama follows them everywhere they go, uh, can, can I tell you that, that that personal agenda and control is the issue. They've got, they, they have their own agenda. And they're accusing you and you, you know, I, I, I'm, a, I'm not a pretty decent communicator, okay? And, and if we're constantly misunderstanding uh, Houston, we have a problem, and it's not me, okay? And, and, and then people have an agenda. They, they have an agenda. They want you, they want you to use the platform of your church or ministry to carry out their little deal. Well, they're just, they're just, they're not a mature one. They don't have a beard yet. You can't, look, you can love them. You can, you can, you know, and I would, I just, I would just, I would just tell them. 
I said, now, now you, don't, you don't want you and me, either one, Jordan, getting in trouble with the Lord, do you? Okay, with your idea? So I'm going to pray about it, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about it later, but I'm not going to implement it unless God speaks it. And I'll pray for you. But what, he, what Jordan wants me to do, though, he wants me to platform his idea, pay for his idea, support his idea. I'm not raising everybody's babies. And, I, and I'm, not, I'm not concerned about Jordan getting offended. I'd rather find out if he's going to get offended early than later when he gets a lot of relationships and then there's a lot of collateral damage. Yeah. So, uh, and, I'm, and I'm watching to see how he responds when I tell him that, look, you know, okay, he's got it. I'm, I'm pro-life and I, I support, um, I support uh, pregnancy centers but he's got a vision, let's say, he wants to go march in front of the, uh, the Planned Parenthood, okay? And I don't have a vision to march in front of Planned Parenthood. Uh, if you want to go hand the girls information about the pregnancy center, now you can do that. But he's got a vision to march. I don't have that vision, and I'm not going to pay for that vision. I'm not going to be... I'm not going to uh, discourage him from his vision, but I've got to stay true to the way I feel like we're supposed to do things and, and then him not judge me and I not judge him, okay? And, but I'm also watching because I'm finding out if by, by my resisting him on that and not promoting that, I'm finding out whether he has a beard or not. Are you hearing me? And you got to go through, see, what, what, what we do in the church today, we're, we're desperate, especially smaller churches, we're desperate for, for people in worship. And so we'll, we'll platform anybody that can, that's got a little bit of talent. But man, you can have so many problems like that. I'd rather sing in Acapulco. Yeah. <laughs> Acapella. Then put somebody up there before they before I see whether they have a beard or not. You got to go through some things with people, guys. And and what I've seen in what I've the reason why most churches and even smaller churches aren't f growing to their capacity. He he told you of the increase of his government, there'll be no end of peace and increase, but it's because his government's not really. You're not allowing his government to have its way. You're not stewarding unity. You're letting anybody and everybody come in. Now look, I let anybody and everybody come in the church, but it's an altogether different thing before I put them in leadership. And then I'm going to I'm going to move off of this. I mean, I I can take questions if you guys have have questions about this because I really care about about unity. But here's the other thing, okay? Um on a board level and on a decision-making level, I don't care how the decisions are made or whether it's, you know, you got deacons that make the decisions and vote, or even if you've got a democratic government where everybody votes, which I think is terrible, but, you know, uh, that's the Assembly of God Church we were in. They had great fellowship, great teaching, terrible, terrible church government. But anyway, even if it's that way, or if it's a pastor, elder-ruled church, or or if it's or if the pastor is is the guy, but he's got he's accountable to some others. Uh, number, here's what I'm going to do in that decision-making group, and then I'm going to take it out beyond that decision-making board to all of my all of my leaders. Everybody's got beards. Are y'all are y'all tracking with me? Okay. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to discuss. Do we want to get rid of pews and get chairs, new carpet? We're going to discuss, uh, do, we need to, do we need to expand the building? Uh, uh, do, we're going to discuss direction and vision, and I'm going to listen to everybody. And then, well, whatever it is, we're going, to, we're, going to, uh, we're going to support the pregnancy center. We're going to support a new ministry, whatever the decision is. We're going to start a new ministry, whatever it is. Uh, but and we're and I'm going to listen to all my leaders, okay? But here's here's what I'm going to require, and and I'm making a commitment first. 
that well, anybody can share whatever they feel pro or con about that decision. And, and, and here's what I'm, what I'm describing to you is where uh, disunity starts, where uh, the lack of accord happens, where the enemy gets in. It's, it starts in leadership. And here's how it, when you don't set this in place, this is what, this is what it just it gives place to the enemy. And so I just, here's what I tell them. All right, you can share with me what you think about, um, you know, we're going to support this initiative or uh, we're going to support this, we're going to start a pregnancy center, whatever it is your vision is. All right? And I want to listen to everybody. And we're, in fact, I'm going to send, it, send them the agenda ahead of time to pray about it. Now we're going to discuss it. And then whenever the decision is made, and however it's made, doesn't matter. But here's the thing. Once the decision's made, everybody in this room, we're going to own that decision. And if you can't own that decision, you're off the leadership team. Even if we decide, I don't like the color that you guys chose. I don't like teal green. And that's not the color. I'm talking about I'm the pastor. But I, I'm listening to everybody and and we got teal green majority. And they that's the way we're making the decision. Okay, you know what? Teal green's not my favorite. But when I leave that room, I've expressed I don't even like teal green. But when when we leave that room, I'm verbally and vocally supporting. I love this carpet. It's awesome. I, I'm, I'm not coming, I'm not leaving that room. Well, you know what? I told them I didn't like that. I told them I wouldn't do that. I, I don't, I know y'all don't, I'm, who, who, in the, who in the world likes teal green? My goodness, for a carpet. Why would we want to do that? Right? And so no matter how the decision's made, let's say you're making a decision to staff somebody, okay? And, and maybe a couple, you always have visionaries and managers on the board. The visionaries can run you out of money <laughs> and the managers, you'll never, the managers by themselves, you'll never do anything. So there's gotta be a healthy balance, okay? But I'm telling you, what, why, am I taking the time, why am I taking the time to share this is because, because in many, we, we, we're blinded. We think that, you know, we, 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 have, we have a responsibility in a leadership team to be the devil's advocate. Really? You have a devil's advocate anointing? No. God's not anointing you to be a devil's advocate. You're just a manager who's trying to help bring some sensibility and wisdom to the vision. It may be a matter of timing or you need to think about this. But here the bottom line is this. If, if, you, if you make the decision to hire the staff member or, or buy the carpet, whether you agreed with it or not, if you're going to be on that team and we're going to have inc increase and in peace with no end, it's, it's solely and and only a leadership issue. And it, and, it, and it can be over carpet that you, you stop the move of God. Put that in your teal green pipe and smoke it. In your devil's advocate pipe and smoke it. And I'm you know, and they, I mean, they spoke over me today. This is a breaker anointing Amen. that I'm, no, I'm serious, that I'm under right now. Yeah. Because we, because we give, we all give ourselves permission to become devil's advocate over, we don't agree with, with a staff member hired, or we don't agree with this, or we don't agree with that. Well, share your disagreement. But if you're going to be on that leadership team, once the decision is made, when you leave that room, you're going to own that decision. And that includes me as the pastor. And I didn't agree with it, but you know what? I gave them the power to make the decision, and I'm not, I'm not a color specialist anyway. So, 
You know, we're going to make the decision and we're going to leave that room. We're going to own it. If you can't do that, you, you've just resigned yourself from that team. And if you don't resign yourself from that team, then you are going to hinder the unity and the blessing and the peace and increase that God can bring. Are you hearing me? Yes, this is not a game we're playing, guys. Nope. And we get and 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 we we come in, you know, from all different kind of backgrounds and worlds, and 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 you know, we come in and we want to you know flex our power in the church. And you don't realize that you are hindering God's power and anointing and stopping. You are. It's a leadership issue. Clearly, only, strictly. And if we, want, if we want to see increase and we want to see peace, guys, we, we've, got to, we, we've got to say, okay, I, you know, and this is the way I provide the leadership with my leaders. I said, I, guys, here's the thing. Even if I don't agree with it, because sometimes I don't even agree with myself. <laughs> even if I don't agree with it, when we, when we leave this room, I'm committed. We're, I'm owning that decision. And if I am, so are you. That means you're not going home. Now, you can tell your wife you didn't agree. That's fine. Or your husband. But, you, but if you proliferate, proliferate that and you get it out, that's gossip. You, you are now opening the door to the enemy to eat our lunch and pop the bag and hinder, hinder the increase in peace. Because it is only, it's strictly and only, unity is strictly and only leadership issue. And it starts just in the areas that I'm talking about. How many of you have been involved in a leadership team and, and it's just everything, you know, because people think they have, you know, some kind of anointing to do it. No, I'm coming in with a breaker anointing to break that off of you. Amen. You've got an anointing to help, to, help, to help establish unity so there's increase in peace and there's no end of that amen? amen and so what I'm encouraging you to do uh, and and look don't you you have to go inside your relationship with God don't go change your bylaws and stuff for my what I'm saying but you got to go at least you got to if God's speaking and he sent me here then then you've got to you've got to examine your leadership teams and make sure that there's unity among your leadership because if there's not then that's going to be, that's the elephant in the room. We discovered, I discovered, pastoring for 27 years, there were three different times there, were, there, were, there was a long downturn financially. And every time, it was because there was strife in my leadership team. And I didn't know it. But, but I, because it gave, what, finance is a barometer. And I go, I go check it out, all right. And sure enough, I find out the youth pastor and the children's pastor, they're at odds with one another. Amen. With my kids, you know what I did? <laughs> what, I did what, what I did with my kids, I had three boys and a girl, especially my boys. Whenever they wouldn't get along, here's my punishment. They got to hug one another for five minutes. <laughs> and then tell each other about what they appreciated about each other. So my, my youth pastor... And my children's pastor, we had, come, we had to come to Jesus. You're not leaving my office. If you want a job, if you enjoy your job, you're not leaving my office until you, you decide you're going to get along. Okay, so I want to stop here. I want to stop here and ask. I, I don't want to come across like I'm insensitive to you or your situation or scenario. I really want to help you. Okay, but, but are, are there any questions about this? Because this is huge, guys. See, we think unity you, you, is preaching, it's preaching to, the, to the people on Sunday morning. It's not. It has nothing to do with it. Here's the other thing, and, I'll and I'll, I can open it up for questions, but I, I've got something else I want to share, too. Um, is as a leader, as a primary leader, it is never appropriate for you to cast vision first on Sunday morning. Why? You've not, you haven't talked to the other leaders about it. How does that make the other leaders feel? Like this. Never cast vision. Now, I'm not saying don't cast vision ever on Sunday morning. Never 
do it there first. You, you, you get with your leaders if you want to if you want to have unity. Otherwise, that's going to create disunity. Amen? Amen. And then and then as a pastor or a senior leader of a ministry, um, your primary responsibility is to get the fire hat off of you as soon as you can. And you spend, you, you, in other words, with the squeaky wheels, the lonely hearts, the wounded hearts, the, the people that, the poor you have with you always, the EGRs, extra grace required. Your responsibility, senior leaders, is to spend 70% of your time with leaders and hand off the EGRs to, to your leaders. Amen? Yeah. You give ministry to your leaders, and then that makes it peaceful for you. So I, I've got something else I want to share, but are, are there any major questions on what I'm, what I'm talking about? Or, or do we understand about unity and how to, how to, uh, how to uh, you know, how, how to develop that, how to, um, make that happen in a, in a first all first of all in your board, and it really doesn't matter. Doesn't matter the, how the government is set up. Doesn't matter if I if I was going to take over a church that was it was deacon possessed. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm teasing. I'm teasing. But but the deacons made all the decisions. Even if I didn't even if I didn't have much of a say, or I just was one vote along with the rest of them. I just I'd go in the same way. I would just tell them look. Here's the deal, guys. If I'm going to come pastor this church, here's how, here's how it's got to be. Because we we've got to steward unity here. And so we can, we can uh, fuss. I was going to say cuss, but better not do that. Fuss and discuss. Okay? Whatever the issue is, and then we can be, you can share all you want to do about this problem, but once a decision's made, when you leave that room, we're all going to own it. However it's made, if it's just we're voting, we're all going to own it. You can steward unity by doing that. Even in, a, even in a, uh, a democratic form of government, which is not, I don't think, the best government, but it doesn't matter. You can still require that. And then if they don't, I'm not pastoring here. I can't pastor here in a place where there's not increase, where, where there's not unity, because there's not going to be increase in peace then. Does that make sense? Yep. And I require the same thing of every department head, every leader. And then I'm, and I'm slow to put somebody in leadership. I want to find out if they got a beard. Okay? So it, are, are we good on this? Yeah. Any questions on this or comments or anything? Is this helpful? Yes. Because we do want, it, we do want increase, don't we? Yeah. We do want increase. Okay? So the second thing that I've discovered, and now I'm going to get real practical. I think that was practical too, fairly practical, but this is going to become more practical. In fact, I, I'll probably send Pastor Sandy a list of these things that I'm, going to, I'm about to talk to you about so she can send it on to anybody who wants it, okay? But um, there are three things, only three things that I know that transform people. And, and what, is our, what is our job anyway? Isn't it to see people's lives changed? Do we, want, do we want to see people's lives? I mean, it's not just about how many people can we gather into a building. How many, how many lives are changed, right? Only three things I know that transform people's lives. Number one is, the, is revelation of the word, okay, is uh, Romans 12, 1 and 2, okay? You're, you're transformed even, you know, by the renewing of your mind. Then number two is the presence of God, the move of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, um, the glory of God is 2 Corinthians 3. We're changed even as by the glory of the Lord when we behold Him, right? Okay, the third thing, so, so I mean, how many of you know worship will, will change you, the gifts of the Spirit, you know, all, uh, all that, the Word of God, how many of you know that will transform people? Third thing, only three things that I know is the love of God through people. The love of God through people. And that is um, Hebrews 3, uh, 13 through 15, uh, Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. We provoke one another to love and good works, and, and you can keep people from hardness of heart by your encouragement and love for them. That's the love of God through, through people. All right, so... 
most of our churches, most of our churches in, in, the, in the group that's here, we usually have the first two down pretty well. And we even have systems set up for those things to happen. But number three, is not, we're not that intentional about. We're just trusting that kind of, you know, everything's going to be all right because we, we are friendly folk here in Kansas and in Texas and Oklahoma. And, you know, we're friendly. And it's not in Colorado, but we're, we, <laughs> I can tell you, you got a whole bunch of transplanted Californians over there. When you see the friendly ones, they're from Texas or Kansas or somewhere, but they're not from there. Anyway, they're, they're different folks. Would you agree, Jordan? I mean, it's, the drivers are different. Anyway, but, um, but so I, we have to train our leaders and our people to be intentionally friendly. And we have to train our leaders and our people to, uh, uh, we have to give them training to love people intentionally because we, are, we, are, we do not do that intentionally. We, we are, we, we're silo people. We're, we're, we think we're not cliquish, but we are. The ushers are in a clique. The worship team's in a clique. I mean, people, you know, they're... Uh, uh, the greeters are in a clique. They all have their little cliques. And I, I know I'm exaggerating a little bit, okay? But they're, they're, on Sunday morning, they're here fellowshipping with each other in their little clique. And we got new people coming in that we're not intentionally loving them and reaching them. So, see, I, I know this sounds a little different from the message last night. Because I don't, we're not supposed to be, I don't want to be seeker sensitive, but I don't want to be guest insensitive either. And so I went to, uh, I went, I went to, God spoke to me to go get my master's degree in, uh, outside of Oklahoma City in a Southwestern Christian University. And so uh, I, I didn't want to do it. I didn't have the money. I didn't have the time. Okay. And it was like, over, it was going to cost 20, what did it cost? $25,000 or something. Two years. And I had to go, it, to go uh, this, I had to go one week at a time. And then I had to read, I don't know how many dozens of books and write reports. And anyway, I got my ring. I'm a, I'm a master pastor. That I'm, 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 <laughs> but God, I, God, God I, just, I, I had to go. I knew God told me to go. And so one of the, one of the, uh, Courses I went to was I was looking forward to the least. It was called church growth because I detested all the church growth strategies I heard. But this guy rang my bell, and he said, you guys are spending all this money. And, and look, now, guys, I, I do have the airport in sight, okay? So we're going to have lunch here in a minute, but how many of you want to hear this, okay? <laughs> I, I, he said, you guys are spending all this money on outreach, and we were. And we had the biggest Easter egg hunt ever <laughs> in our area. We had 2,500 people come out in a city of 5,000. The next year, we had 4,000 people come out. And we preached the gospel to them. 30,000 eggs. And gave away bicycles and Xboxes and all kinds of stuff. And got people saved. 500 people get, got saved. Uh, it, maybe we had two or three come to our church. But the bottom line is we're spending thousands of dollars on outreach. And this guy, this, this guy told me, he said, and, he, and most of us were pastors in this room. He said, but what are you doing about your first line of outreach? And my antennas went up. I said, first line of outreach? He said, yeah, it's the guest that's walking through your back door. What are you doing? And I had to admit, we weren't doing anything. In fact, we were doing things. We were doing things that were turning guests off, and some of it was me. I was the elephant in the room, and I I came back. I mean, I I was I was undone. I was devastated that I I'd pastored at that time 
17 years and hadn't even thought about this. What are you doing about the guests that's come? God, I'm sending guests to you. And you're, you're preaching the word and you got good worship, but you are not, you have not developed systems to love and care for, that, for that, those guests and tr you're not training your people to care for them in a way that's not going to send them out the door. We were getting, we were having four to ten guests that would come every Sunday and we were having, we had about uh, less than 5%, probably 2% that ever came back. Yeah. And you know what? That's about the way it is with most, church, most churches today. And that's why there's not the increase that we could have. So I came back. I told, I told my, I got with my leaders. I said, guys, God's, we're, we're going to shut down all outreach for one year until you guys can help me find out what do we do with the guests that comes in here? How are we loving them, connecting with them? I'm not talking about uh, back in, putting the Holy Spirit in the back room. I'm not talking about backing off on preaching about the baptism of the Holy Spirit or letting the gifts operate. I'm talking about what, what, what can we do to intentionally love that guest and connect with that guest so we can disciple them? Anybody want to know? And I just met, I, I, I just met with, with them, and so I'm going to give you a list of things here. And if you don't have time to write them all down, I'll type them out, give them to uh, Sandy. She can, get, she can give them to you, okay? That I, I, and here's what I told my, my lead. I had a, t a leadership team of about 40 people, and I said, okay, here's the deal. Every idea that we implement that will help us get that guest from the back door to, be, to either come to a life group or get involved with one of the service groups of either worship or children's church or usher, greeter, parking lot attendant, whatever, get them serving somewhere so they could be discipled in that servant team or come to the pastor's class, which is like the next steps, okay? That's the only way I can determine how to, whether I can measure whether that person is discipled on one of those levels, you you help me get that to happen, and and uh, I'm going to pay you hundred dollars for every idea that we implement. I paid eleven $1 hundred dollars for a almost hundred thousand dollar benefit in the numbers of people that came. Are you hearing me? Yeah. And and most of these are essentially practical, but some of them you're going to see. They, they were blocking guests from coming back. And, and I want to, how many of you want increase? But, but we're the elephant in the room sometimes, guys. And don't, don't anybody go change what you're doing just because I'm telling you these things. But I'm telling you these things. I let my leaders talk and I said, I said it can even be me. If it's something I'm doing, Okay, and, I, and again, I'm not talking about being seeker sensitive over Holy Spirit sensitive. I'm just talking about give me ideas about how can we minister to that guest and help them become a disciple so they can learn the word and get filled with the spirit and so on. Okay, so number one, El Numero Uno, cut the announcement time down. There's no Holy Spirit anointing in that. How many, you're up there, you got a bulletin and you're reading 15 announcements. Give me an ignorant break. <laughs> That's exactly what you're doing. You're attributing ignorance. And, and I, was the, I was the one attribute, attributing ignorance to your people that they can't read the bulletin. Yeah. And it's because you're walking into fear of man with your department heads. Because you don't, your department heads won't want you to verbally announce everyone, everything they're doing 15 times. You got one time. We're going to do two or three announcements. Everything else is in a bulletin. Well, what if they don't show up to the chili cook-off or whatever your deal is? Or the, you know, well, they just don't show up then. Two announcements. Everybody say two. two. 
How many of you love announcements? I want to know seriously. How many of you love it? How many of you just love the pastor or whoever reading announcements? How many of y'all love it? Guests hate it. And this keeps us, this is one, you know, I know these, look, you may not, I may not ever get invited back. I'm just, but this is a breaker anointing. It's an announcement break. <laughs> Hallelujah. Um, d don't ask guests to stand or lift their hands. Don't ask, they don't want, they do not want to lift their hands. They do not want to stand. Okay. What do you do instead? This was, we provide get, guest cards in the front, back of the seat or in the bulletin. And what we do is, is we have this nice lady stand up and say, we're so glad you chose to worship with us today at Faith Community Church. And in your bulletin, uh, if you're a guest with us in your bulletin, you'll notice that there's a place for you to give us your information. And if you've got a prayer request, we'd, we'd like to pray with you about that. And if you, will, if you will fill that out and bring it to the hospitality room, that was another $100 idea. We started a hospitality room. Janice and I would go afterwards. If you'll bring that, this, gift, uh, that, this guest card, connect card, to the hospitality room, we will give you, who, who's got a travel mug? Anybody got one with you? Anyway, a ni we had a nice travel mug uh, and, a, and a nice pen, not, not just a pastor's CD. They won't come back there for your CD. <laughs> we, spent, we spent eight bucks, 750, on a really, and we had cookies and we had a nice room back there. And if you'll, if you'll, if you'll come back there and give us your card, we will exchange that card for this, and we had like Vanna, you know, was there with this nice travel mug and a, and a pen. But listen, 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 that $100 idea, we went from getting 5%, 7% guest cards to 90%. So guess what that allowed us to do? We got to follow up on the guest. We got to mail them cards. We had a card call, card mailing team. We had a phone calling team. They would reach out to them. They would not bug them, but just let them know, you know, events that were happening, invite them to life groups. And now we had information where we could connect with that guest and minister to that guest. And it was, it was phenomenal for, for eight bucks. Okay. I'm just giving you, telling you how many of you want increase. Okay. You, you, you got to get the guest cards. Or you can't minister to them. And here's the other thing. I found out we had a place on there I accepted Christ today. We would always give an altar call, but I didn't have them stand up and come down. What I did was lift your hand during if you accepted the Lord. And then I had prayer teams down to the front at the end. They could come and pray. But a lot of them didn't come and pray. Okay? But here was another $100 idea. We instituted section pastors in, a, in the sections. And the, what did the section pastors do? They watched for everybody that lifted their hand that didn't come down. They watched for the guests that came in and, and they would help take them back to the hospitality room. And uh, the section pastors also would help me watch out for the MIAs, the missing in action. And who are the missing in action? People that have been gone two or three weeks and you as a pastor didn't notice. But they'll call them. If they're gone two weeks, Hey, I missed you last week. Everything okay? Anything we can pray with you about? Is this good? Yeah. My, my, my leaders gave me these ideas, guys. It's phenomenal. <laughs> then um, stop calling them visitors. Call them guests. Visitors just are come and go. Guests are, are somebody that you, you're part of your family. And then we implemented, uh, yeah, just stop calling them visitors. I, and that, I mean, I would require that of my people. Then I'm, I'm going to give you several things. I, like I said, I'll write them, I'll write them down and get, get them to you. But then we implemented usher and wife teams. Forget the ushers by themselves. The ushers sitting there jawing with one another, talking about the chiefs or talking about the Something, you know, they're talking and they're not, I want, I want a wife with the husband because she's going to be more sensitive as in the hospitality area of a new person coming in. 
Oh, I, you, you, she, they walk in the church and, and they're like deer in the headlights. Look, oh, could I show you to the, could I show you to the uh, nursery or, or the children's ministry, right? And, and then, oh, by the way, do you, uh, are, you, are you meeting anyone today? Would you like to sit with us? Or in, introduce them to the section pastor to sit by. Are you hearing me? And then, um, and, and then um, let me see. I want to make sure I, I, cover, I cover everything here. Okay. Um, then you gotta, you got to train, train your leadership teams to be intentionally friendly. Okay, every leadership team. And I'm special, especially talking about the worship team right now because they're the worst clique in the church. <laughs> they get down from the platform, go back in the room, drink coffee, come back at the end of the service. And we shut that down. Forget it. I'll, we'll sing in Acapulco if you're going to do that. But I'm, plat I'm platforming you. So you know what you're going to do? Every team, every leadership team, here's what you're going to do. You're going to touch people for me. And we have the 5-2-1 rule. Everybody say five. five. So here's five is this. Every leader, all of my leaders, I want you to walk slowly through the crowd. Come a little bit early, stay a little bit late. I want you to name five people by name that you know. People love to hear their name. I want you, I'm empowering you. I'm talking about becoming an intentionally friendly church so the increase can happen. You're going to name five people by name. Then I want you to introduce yourself to two people you haven't met before. Two people. Usually those are guests. Two people. And here's what you're never going to do. You never, ever, 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 never, ever, ever, never, ever going to do. Uh, hi, my name's Greg. What's your, what is your name? Linda. Linda, is this your first time? No. How many times has Linda been here? She's been here three months. How does that make Linda feel? You're a leader. And you've asked, and I, look, this is a $100 idea that we discovered we were running guests off we were not transforming them by love because, because, yeah, maybe we haven't met, but you ask them, this is, your, is this your first time? What do you do and said, hey, we, have, I, we haven't met before. You know, my, name, my name's Greg. Where do, you, where do you work? You know, you can just talk about their family, whatever, but you don't ask them, ever ask them, is this your first time? And then you certainly don't ask somebody, is this, is this your husband or, or, or wife or, or is this your mother? which I did one time. Is this your mother? And you don't, don't, you don't, you don't say, when's that baby due? Uh, Terry, it just, you never get that one back. But see, I, I know we're, we're having fun here and I know this is practical, but guys, what I'm doing is telling you the things that we learned and we trained one another as leaders that we did in order, to, in order to transform our church into an intentionally friendly but loving church that, that removed obstacles that was run. The things I'm talking about is what runs people off. Uh, five, two, two, is, two is you introduce yourself to two people that you have that that you don't know their name, and just hey, my name is. And by the way, leaders, here's an important thing. Okay, if there's somebody that you can't remember their name, now this isn't uh, this is just leverage. Okay, it's good leverage. Send one of your leaders back there. You forgot their name. Send them back and ask them to come back and tell you their name, because they have been here six months, but they've been gone a couple months, and I t I forgot. You know. Dave, would you go? Would you go back and find out? I don't know. I, I I remember Leroy. I don't remember his wife's name. Would you go back, and and come back and tell me? Well, I have, I had a distant aunt. Okay, that I 
and she, she visited from out of town, and I didn't know her name. And I sent one of my leaders to go back and find the name. But see, people, you, you introduce yourself to, to, to people and don't ever say, is this your first time? And then one, I want you to, as a leader, I want you to end one conversation, have some meaningful conversation that maybe end with prayer or ministry to, with one person. Now, I, 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 40 leaders, and I'm talking about worship team. I'm talking about children's ministry. I'm talking about ushers, greeters, parking lot attendants, everybody. I'm, I want you to touch people for me. And then I want you to watch for the spiritual wallflowers on the back row who come late and leave early. And I want you to touch them for me. And then here's the other thing I empowered my leaders to do. Once a month, I want you to budget to invite a guest to lunch. You couldn't come to our church as a guest and not get invited to lunch. Do you know, okay, people come to church because of the word and worship. They will stay only when, there's, when there's, they develop meaningful relationships or they find, or, or, or they find uh, uh, fulfilling places to serve. And that, I, w I want to build relationship. And then you invite them out to lunch. If they go, now they may not go with you, but you invite them out to lunch and then you, you ask them, well, look, uh, you know, would you like to come to our life group? You know, or would you, would you come to the pastor's class, which is our next steps thing, you know? And, and then it helps people. Then um, uh, I talked I talk, I talk to you about the section pastors, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I did two, I had, Two couples in each section. Front and back. Kind of middle and back, yeah. And, and man, it was, it was the best thing. It was awesome. 18 months for our leaders to learn. Yeah. It took about 18 months to get to it. But once, it, once, once we got it a part of the culture, it was amazing. Then uh, they, they told me this, Pastor Greg, you're a great teacher. They weren't patronizing me. They said, you're really a good teacher, but we want... On Sunday morning, we want you to cut, cut the preaching time down five to ten minutes. Because I was going about 50 minutes, sometimes 55. <laughs> and they said, you know, 40 to 45 minutes. I, you know what? It takes more discipline and more preparation to do it in less time. And for, for guests, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not talking about putting the Holy Spirit in the back room. Like we didn't do that at all. And then we implemented a card and, and phone calling teams to follow up on people. And then, and then we, um, we started, we, we, I, took, I would take time in a service to, to explain biblically when there was a demonstration of the Spirit. And then that way we didn't have any problem. We had the gifts, but I would stop and say, I didn't. I didn't preach it. I just said what you saw because they're new people and they, it's brand new, okay? What you saw, you can find that here in 1 Corinthians 14. Here's where it's at. Just want you to know it's biblical what we, and, 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 it was, and it was awesome. Amen? Yeah. And then, then one more thing. Uh, you, you invest in nice restrooms and children's and nursery because moms make the decision about church. You can, you can, you can be unspiritual. You can, you can say, well, that's just not spirit. I'm telling you, you don't have something for baby in the nursery and you put a grandma back there. It's all right to have teenagers, but you, you hire, you make sure you hire a grandma. It can be, as long as she's born again, it can be from outside your church. Hire, put a grandma in the nursery and make sure we spent $30,000 on our upgrading our bathrooms like you guys have done here. And all these things that I'm telling you about, and I, I mean, and it's more, okay? Um, the water level of our church rose and there was increase. Why? Because we were intentional, doing things intentionally to love people and now I am actually empowering my people, okay, to be more intentional about that. Look, you're not, I don't, here, I mean, here was another thing 
Uh, I don't want you in the back room on Sunday morning. If your church service starts at, at, 10, at 1030, past 10 o'clock, I do not want anybody praying in the back room somewhere. People are coming. Now's the time to minister. You be prayed up already. I'm, I didn't say don't pray. I want you to pray. I want you to be prayed up. I want you to depend on the Holy Spirit. But after 10 o'clock, nobody's in any back room praying. They're out here touching people for me. Amen? Amen. And I, I mean, I had, to, I had to really get into the, uh, in the middle of the worship, worship team. I platform you. So you know what you're going to do with your influence? You, you're going to touch people for me. That's what you're going to do. Or I'm, or I'm going to get one person with a guitar who's got a decent voice. And here was the other thing, and I know you're not going to be happy about this, but, but uh, uh, we, we had to be honest about we had some people up, on the, up in the worship team that couldn't sing. And they were a distraction. And they're up there because they want to be noticed. And they're up there because they've always been up there. And we had auditions, and we put some people, we set some people down that don't have gifts, that can't sing, a tune in a bucket. And you got people up on the worship team that don't look. It'd be better if you just if you just do videos. You can do great Hillsong videos. If you don't have a you don't have a worship team, do Hillsong videos, and you can still worship. Yeah. Then then to getting people up there that can't sing <laughs> and can't stay, you know. And then, and then here, here's the other thing is you got, everybody's got the tambourine lady. I don't know if there's one of them here. I'm not, I'm, I mean, like I said, I might not get asked back. But you got the tambourine lady, and she's got the streamers on her tambourine, you know, to show you that she's more anointed. Or it could be tambourine man. I don't care. Whatever it is, but they're out there doing it, the, and they're always a half a beat off. They're not going to tambourine in my church. They're not. They're going to audition. If they're, gonna, they're, if they're not going to do it out here, they're going to go up on the stage if they can keep a beat. And I'm not against tambourines, okay? But, but it's like you got, you've, got to, you've got to identify. Let your leaders listen to them. They'll identify the elephants in the room and it, what it, because these are the kinds of things that send people off. And we still had the gifts of the Spirit, move of the Spirit. It was powerful. But now, we, we, we kept 50 families that year. 50. Name them. Count them. 50. 50 new families. <laughs> That's better than a sharp stick in the eye. Are you hearing me? And you know what? It was just all because we, you know, we, we stopped and talked about you know, and there's sometimes reasons why our churches stay small. And God, I, I'm not saying, you know, again, it's like it seems like this is opposite of what my message was last night. But God wants us to grow. But we, but we have to be honest among our leaders and talk about these things and listen. So I cut my messages down. And, we, and it was still powerful. Yeah? yeah, and my and my leaders that they stopped asking if there, is this your first time, and the ushers stopped congregating back there by themselves, and it was ushers and wives, and they were really ministering to people, and we had section pastors watching for people. People lifted their hands, and hey, I noticed you lifted your hand. Could could I pray for you? And they take them back to the hospitality room. I was getting ninety percent of the guest cards. We were following up on them. They started coming to life groups. The church started growing like it never had before, and it was the easiest church to pastor. Wow. Guys, this is phenomenal stuff. And I know it's a lot of it's practical. I know you could say it's, you know, this is just not spiritual, but I tell you, but for the church to grow and for us to reach people, and we did not put the Holy Spirit in the back room to do this. Any questions? I'm, I went over time, but any questions about this? Comments? Criticisms? Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for increase. I, I pray unity 
and peace, Father, and harmony over every leadership team of every church and ministry that's represented here. And then, Father, uh, you, you've, you've given your wisdom among the, their leaders, Lord, to help be intentional about uh, ministering to guests and to, and to uh, create a culture of love and connection in, in, the, in the body. And so, Father, uh, I pray for increase of that. I pray for revelation on this. And, uh, and, and, and pray just what your word says, increase and peace over our ministries in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. 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 Blessings, guys.